Our Old Testament scripture reading comes from the prophet Joel. The reading from Joel chapter 2, verse 18 through the end of the chapter. Hear then the word of the Lord. Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. I will remove the northerner far from you and drive him into a parched and desolate land, his vanguard into the eastern sea and his rearguard into the western sea. The stench and foul smell of him will rise, for he has done great things. Fear not, O land, Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Fear not, you beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green. The tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and vine give their full yield. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the latter rain as before. The threshing floors shall be full of grain. The vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and there is none else, and my people shall never again be put to shame. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be those who escape as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Sometimes it's hard when we uh, come to a passage like this, it's at least hard for me, uh, because there's so much here. There's so much that we could look at, there's so much that we could dive more deeply into, and we simply have to have a little bit of a limited scope, in part because we have somewhat uh, limited time. But at the outset, let me simply say that this is a a promise of restoration for the people of Israel. That God had judged them. They had been judged in various ways, but he was promising that he would restore them. And multiple times as part of that promise, he speaks of the fact that he will give them grain and wine and oil. You should keep those in mind. Keep those in mind anytime you're reading Uh, prophecy in the Old Testament. Anytime you're reading any kind of poetry in the Old Testament, these will show up a lot. They're symbols of the harvest, of abundance. They're connected here to being satisfied, that God will satisfy his people with these. But they're also symbols of spiritual life. Bread, that is grain and wine anointing oil. Right? This is more than just a promise of physical blessing for the people. And you see this in, in the portion that we're going to focus on in the latter part of what we read, where God promises that he's going to pour out his spirit. He promises through Joel a day when he was going to pour his Holy Spirit out on all flesh, he says meaning all categories of people, right? All of his people would receive his Holy Spirit in a way that had not taken place yet. He describes it as both the, you know, the the sons and the daughters, the old and the young, even the, the servants, 
even those who had no prominence of their own. To all of them, he says twice, I will pour out my spirit. Everything else that he says is kind of sandwiched between those two lines. I will pour out my spirit. You might not realize how extraordinary that promise was. You might not realize how extraordinary it is that God has done this. But up to this point, God's spirit would come in power upon particular people that had particular roles, but it was not a a universal of all of his people. It was not something that they all experienced in the same way. It was usually limited to particular roles such as prophets or priests or kings, and even there only sometimes for particular tasks. But now he says all of his people would receive this outpouring, right? Not just the prophets and priests and kings of that day. And this may have sounded familiar to you because in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, after Jesus is risen from the dead and after the Spirit of God has descended like tongues of fire upon the apostles in the upper room, Peter tells the crowd that what Joel was talking about here, what he prophesied, was happening. That it took place. It was being fulfilled in his day in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. This is part of the blessing of the new covenant. That all of God's people receive his spirit. That all of God's people are gifted for ministry by the Holy Spirit. That all of you, his people, have been empowered and indwelt by the comforter, the the one who comes with power. And so you should read this passage as a prophecy of the blessings that you have received through the work of Jesus Christ. As he was sent, as he accomplished the work of salvation, so he returned to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit upon you for your upbuilding, for your perfecting, your completing. And when God promises through Joel a coming day, when God will provide grain that is bread and wine, right? this is a blessing of God that he has given to you, his provision, his satisfaction that he has given to you through the life of faith. When he promises the oil, which represents the anointing, that is given, the spiritual anointing that is given. This is something that you have, right? This is typologically speaking of the blessings that you receive in Christ. You receive the bread and the wine, the blessing of God, and you have received an anointing from God, his Holy Spirit, if you have believed. We'll talk more about this. The New Testament reading and sermon text today comes from 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16 to 17. You'll find it in the Pew Bibles on page 953. Hear then the word of the Lord. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. This is God's holy and inspired word for us this morning. As we're continuing in this series on the foundations of the faith, tracing those things we confessed earlier in the Apostles' Creed, we come to the The confession that we believe in God, the Holy Spirit. And how do you best preach on the person and work of the Holy Spirit in just one sermon? I don't know how to do that, especially when particularly the the person and work of the Holy Spirit. If there is one person of the Godhead that has his name uh, blasphemed and trampled on and and in so many ways confused and misunderstood in the church today, it really seems to be the Holy Spirit. So it's admittedly difficult, but I am confident that as we meditate upon him, 
As we meditate upon the Holy Spirit, He will reveal Himself to us. He will draw near to us through His Word. Now, God is one. Right? There's one God. We don't want to in any way fall into some kind of false understanding when we're talking about the persons of the Godhead that we're talking about three different gods. Right? That there's a Father, a Son, a Spirit. They're all separate No, there's one God, there's one name into which you are baptized, but that one God does eternally exist in three persons. It's not to say that there are three different wills at work within God, all doing their own thing, or anything like that. No, God is one. He works as one. But Scripture makes this distinction and and teaches us this distinction, especially as we're taught about the, the procession and the operations of these persons. Right? So the Son, we've talked about, is eternally begotten of the Father. And the Spirit eternally proceeds from Father and Son, is, is spirated, is breathed out, in a sense. Each person of the Trinity is seen to be at work in various ways throughout Scripture. Abraham Kuyper a uh, Reformed theologian and politician from the Netherlands in the 19th century, I think he helpfully broke down the, the way, or one of the ways anyway, that we should think of the, the different works of God. He said that we should think of the Father as the author of all things, the Son as the mediator of all things, and the Spirit as the perfecter of all things. Author, mediator, and perfecter. I think this will be helpful for you as you think about the the way that Scripture has revealed God to us, the way that that He has revealed Himself. I think that those will be helpful categories. We see this in creation, that God, I think we're supposed to think the Father says, let there be light. He speaks, He authors, and we're told that the Word that He speaks in essence, is his son. He creates through his son. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. In the beginning, he was with God. And nothing that was created was created apart from him, but it was all created through him, through the word, through the son. He is the word of the father. And the spirit, we're told in Genesis, at this time was hovering over the face of the waters carrying out, bringing to completion this work. The same thing is true in redemption. God the Father sends the Son in order to save the world and His elect. The Son accomplishes the work. He becomes the mediator of the new covenant. And the Holy Spirit then applies that work to those who believe. So I think this will be helpful for you as you think about the work of the Holy Spirit, if you've ever been confused about this, the Holy Spirit is at work bringing about to completion the plan and work of God. He he is the perfecter of what God has done. And knowing that he is the perfecter of God's work, carrying out to completion that which he has begun, I want you to to then hear this question. Right, this is a question straight from the text today. This is what we're going to be meditating on. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? Do you not know that God's Spirit dwells in you? Let me read it again for us. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. In 1 Corinthians, Paul's combating all kinds of destructive tendencies that were at work in the church in Corinth. Right? The church was dividing and fighting and and factioning into groups over all kinds of different things, right? Almost everything that you could think of, they were breaking apart over. In in fact, they're they're doing that 
except in the ways that they're supposed to, right? We're taught that they, they weren't carrying out the discipline of the church in the way they were supposed to, but they were separating on the basis of which preacher they liked best or, or which gifts that they had or, or these sorts of things. And so in order to keep the church from imploding or exploding, and in order to help the Corinthians realize who they are, Paul tells them, you are the temple of God. And Paul is speaking corporately here. And this is applied both corporately and individually in Scripture. But here corporately, not individually. He's saying that, that the church, the people of God, is the temple of God in the new covenant. Well, in what way? Right? What, what exactly does that mean? Well, think about what the temple was. What was the temple? It was the place where God met with his people. It was spoken of as God's dwelling place. It's where God would meet with people in a way that he didn't meet with them anywhere else. Right? God, God is everywhere. He's present everywhere. And yet, there are particular places where he would actually meet with his people in a way that he did not anywhere else. This was the temple. It's called a house or dwelling for God. David set out to build the temple so that God would have a, a house, right? A place to dwell, to, to be. And God didn't allow David to do that because he was a man of war, a man of blood. There was a lot of blood on his hands and, and the temple was to be holy. And so he tells David that he's not to do this. Rather, Solomon was to build the temple after him. And when the temple's being built, the Holy Spirit inspired men in the building, right, in the architecture, in the, in the beautifying of this place. So he was at work through all of it, building the kind of dwelling that he desired. And when Solomon was dedicating the temple, he, he spoke in awe of the fact that God would dwell in this particular way among his people, knowing that God can't be contained by a particular building. It's not as though God was trapped in there or stuck there or that he was limited to that place, but that God would listen to people as they prayed from the temple, that he would meet with them and dispense his grace to them as they met with him there. He would dwell with his people in this place. In 2 Chronicles 7, we're told this. This is just after Solomon has dedicated the temple. He's prayed to the Lord, a prayer of dedication. It says, as soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. When all the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. The Spirit of God filled this dwelling place, filled this temple. And it appears to the people as fire coming down from heaven. The temple was thus set apart, made a holy place where God dwelt by his Spirit, and it's connected to fire falling from heaven. Does that remind you of anything that happens in the New Testament? Fire coming down from heaven. This is what we spoke about earlier, right? The day of Pentecost that Joel prophesied about. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit is poured out, he appears as tongues of fire coming and resting upon the apostles. So God in Christ was building a new temple, and the Spirit of God indwelt that temple. You are the temple of of the living God. Right? You, God's people, are now his temple. Peter speaks of this in 1 Peter 2. He says, as you come to him, that is Christ, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. 
the image is that Jesus himself is the, the cornerstone or the capstone or both, but he's, he's the start of this new temple, this new building, and you are built up on top of him. You are built on him as a living stone, right? Something that is alive, filled with the life of God, filled with the Holy Spirit. And in building this new temple of God's people, the Spirit now dwells among you. And when I say you are the temple, I don't mean this building. Right? I don't mean this, this physical place is the temple. No, it's, it's you, God's people. Each of you as, you, as you share in that same Spirit, in the Holy Spirit of God. When you believe, when you truly trust in Christ, you receive the deposit of the Holy Spirit. He becomes a guarantee of who you are and whose you are, and God dwells in you, and he dwells among you corporately. You can't contain him. He's not trapped in you. He's not trapped in these walls. He's not trapped among us. He's at work wherever he pleases, like the wind that blows where it blows, so is the Holy Spirit of God. And yet, he has decided that he would in a particular way dwell among you and in you. And that's a cataclysmic truth. And in order to better bring that home, what I want to do is, is kind of press into different aspects of this question, this central question that Paul asks, do you not know that God's Spirit dwells in you? Okay, how do, we, how do we just kind of drill a little bit deeper into that? So we can't just give a quick answer, can't just easily pass it by. In order to do that, I want to ask three subsidiary questions about this, right? If, if God's Spirit dwells in you, and the question here from Paul, it's rhetorical, right? Don't you know you should. You should know. Right? Of course you should know. His spirit does dwell in you, in other words. So let me ask you then this. Do you know what that means for holiness? God himself is in your midst. Right? That should shape the way that you think about how to live, don't you think? If God in all of his holiness is in your midst, dwells within you, wouldn't you act then accordingly? Wouldn't that change something about the, the paradigm of life for you? You see, we're so quick to change our behavior, to change how we live because of the perception of others. Right? When we're around certain people, maybe how you work in your workplace, maybe it changes a little bit because the boss comes around, right? Maybe you sit up straighter, you act a little different, right? We're so quick to change how we act, how we live or behavior because of other people's perception, right? You've got kids. When the kids are in the room, maybe there's certain things you don't talk about. You don't say in front of them. You do something a little bit different. Maybe at church, you're talking to the pastor, so you you talk a little bit different than you would otherwise. So we see that we should change how we live around other people. Well, don't you know that the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you? Don't you recognize that? Right? That should be the primary motivation for how you live. And not just in an outward, you know, washing the outside of the cup sort of way. Not just changing behavior on the outside. But actually understanding if, if God's Spirit dwells within me, that changes everything. Right? That is now the paradigm for how I am to live in all of my life. That is the primary motivation for living life anew and for seeking to please God. And your life reflects on him. If he has made his dwelling place in and among you, then how you live reflects on him. 
our lives as a church reflect not just on us, not just on one another, which is true, but it also reflects on God himself. He's united himself with us in such a way that when we live shameful lives, it reflects upon him. When people see your life and when people see this church and how we live and act, is it the work of the Holy Spirit that they see? Because that's what it should be, the the supernatural work of God setting us apart for himself. That's what should be made manifest in our lives is the glory of Christ. More than that, because God's Spirit dwells in you, it means that you, in a sense, are holy ground, right? Where God dwells, it, it is holy ground. And you that are, in a sense, holy ground, you carry around holy ground with you with the presence of God. So what should that do in how you think of yourself, your life, and the church, right? Those others around you, those people around you, indwelt by God's Spirit, right? How do you think of them? Paul warns in the text here that if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. And that was happening, right? The the Corinthians were, were destroying one another. They were tearing apart the church because of all kinds of reasons their personal sin, their lack of discipline, their pride, their personal preferences. And so Paul warns them, right, to despise God's dwelling is to despise him, and that comes with judgment. God is just to repay those who treat holy ground with contempt. And so think about the times that you have slandered the people around you, talked ill of them when they weren't around, maybe. Right? Think of the times that you have, you have treated others within the church with contempt. That is to treat the dwelling place of God with contempt. Right? Go back to the Old Testament. Think of the actual temple, the physical temple. I shouldn't say actual, but the physical temple in the Old Covenant. Think of that and all the ways that someone could treat the temple with contempt. They could despise it. They could treat it kind of haphazardly. They could defame the temple. They could degrade it uh, by doing immoral things in the temple. They could offer false worship, false sacrifice. They could neglect the temple and the duties that it required of them. Well, if you are the temple of God, then how you treat this body, how you treat those around you here speaks to what you think about the Holy Spirit that dwells in our midst. It also means if, if the Holy Spirit dwells in you, right, if the Holy Spirit is indwelling you corporately and individually, It means that we should be set apart. It means that if the Holy Spirit is in us, we should also be holy. And the word holy means set apart. It's it's not uh, purely moral. It has moral overtones, but it's not just saying that, but it, it does mean that we are to look different and be different and live differently than what is common. The church is not the place for us to be the most like the world around us, right? Someone who hates God, who enters a church and feels completely at home and comfortable, there's something wrong, there's something not quite right. Hopefully, people that don't believe can be welcomed and and loved in the church. That's part of reflecting the love of God in his spirit that dwells in us. But if we are to be holy, it means that there's going to be times when we are looked down on because of how we live or we are hated because of how we live or how we worship, right? The the nature of righteousness, the nature of the righteousness that we have, the, the light of the glory of God, which is righteousness, that shines in our lives if we are in Christ, the nature of that is that 
those who are in darkness who don't want to be exposed, when you live a certain way around them, well, it, it's, it's going to be something that they despise, that they don't like. They're going to want to cut you off or cause you to come back into darkness with them. It should take time as we are slowly being transformed to be more like Christ for us to really, in a sense, feel comfortable in his presence, worshiping him. It's the nature of holiness. So, do you know what this means? The, the dwelling of God's spirit in your midst means for holiness. And do you know what it means for power? for the power that is at work in you, the power of the Spirit of God that brought Christ Jesus back from the dead. We think of power a lot of times in negative terms, I think. I don't know exactly why that is. We're maybe a bit more sensitive as a culture to different power dynamics. We have a bit more of a, you know, egalitarian or democratic impulse, right, where we're all equal, and so anything that that smells of hierarchy we're kind of a little distrustful of. And power, talking about power, can kind of move in that way. So I don't know if that's why, but, but we often think of power in those negative terms. But power is simply the ability to carry out, to accomplish that which you want to do or plan to do. Right? It's, it's ability, it's, it's being able to do. Well, do you realize the power that God has given to you and filled you with if the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you? The Spirit of God has come upon you for power. Remember, again, as, as a perfecter to carry out the plan of God in your life. And this touches on everything. This touches on every aspect of the Christian life. It means that you have power in prayer. If you thought about that, the power that you have in prayer as a believer. James says that Elijah was just a man. And he prayed and God stopped the rain because he prayed for it. Right? And brought it back when he asked him again. You have that power. The same spirit that empowered the prayers of Elijah is at work in you. It's not to say that this is some kind of name it and claim it sort of thing. This is not to say that God is a slot machine or a vending machine. But it is to say that as you are transformed and renewed by the spirit of God, Right? As your will becomes more aligned with him, you can pray with boldness and God will work through your prayers. He will answer your prayers. Remember last week when we talked about Abraham and God speaking to Abraham as a man speaks to a man. And he brought Abraham into his decision about what to do with Sodom and Gomorrah. He allowed Abraham to intercede for people in Sodom and Gomorrah. He wanted Abraham to be a part of that. And that's true of all believers. Right? As we grow in maturity, we are moving from one degree of glory to another, one degree of knowledge to another. And as we, as we grow in that maturity, God desires that we would take part in his work in this world. You realize that the power that you have in prayer, the, the power that is at work in you also means that you need not be afraid. Right, this world is full of wickedness. And enemies of Christ and his people, of trials and suffering, right? all of the, the things that you could think of right now that you are fearful of, your own failures, right? your own sin, whatever it may be, when we look at those things through just a purely earthly lens, right? maybe through your own power or lack thereof, you may be fearful, you may be afraid. But the Lord says, behold, I have overcome the world. Right? And the, the Spirit 
of power that is at work in you is the spirit that created all things. Is the, the spirit that brings about all things that come to pass. And so you need not be afraid. You need not be fearful of what will come if he is at work in you. The power that you have is the power of the Spirit of God that gifts you for life and ministry. And this doesn't necessarily look like the kind of miraculous things that we read about in Scripture. And often today, when the work of the Holy Spirit is talked about, it's talked about as, well, well why don't we see you know, these, these big miraculous healings and, and the things that the apostles did, right? Why, why don't we see these prophecies and, and other things like that? We want to see that which is maybe more spectacular. That's what we associate a lot of times with the work of the Holy Spirit. But the normative work of God's Spirit is not in those extreme acts, the healing and the prophecies, the tongues. The normative way that the Spirit works is through things like imbuing craftsmen that he desires to build his temple. Right, bringing them who he has given great skill to the place that he wants them to build the kinds of things that he wants to build. The normative way that the, the Spirit of God works is in changing how you live so that you love others, so that you care for others, so that you are full of the, the fruit of the Spirit abundantly, so that you give, give life in a sense, to those around you. The way that the Spirit works is by taking people who are in just generations of sin and pulling them out, plucking them out, and changing generations after them. The Holy Spirit of God works in, in a lot of the normal, everyday ways that we live. Right? Each of us has a, a calling, a vocation from God. You have a calling where you're at right now, right? What he has you doing. And it might not seem exciting all of the time, but the Spirit of God is at work through you to accomplish his purposes. If the Spirit is the perfecter, then he is working through you to complete his purposes, to perfect things, to bring them to their completion. So as you go about your day-to-day -day work, you can rely upon and trust that it is it is him who's at work as you take care of your kids, right? As you do the, the job that maybe you're not super happy with, but it's what you have right now. It's what God has put in front of you. Each of you also has a role to play then as he has gifted you, as he has formed you, as he is working to perfect you. You have a, a role to play within the greater body of the church, that he is bringing you to a particular people, those who are around you right now, because you have a role to play. You have particular gifts that the body needs, that this fellowship needs. And so that means you, you don't uh, discount yourself. You don't look down on what the Spirit has made you for. And you might sometimes think, in the life of the church, well, you know, maybe I'm not, well, I'm not much of a teacher. Or maybe I'm not that, you know, intellectual, studying theology and these sorts of things. Or, or whatever it might be, right? Whatever those things are that we think are what God values most. I'm not really a person to be up front in front of everyone else. I don't really like that sort of thing. I'm not the most personable. Whatever it is that we put value on we think of as the important things. Right? You might not think that you have what the church needs. But the very fact that the Spirit of God has brought you here means that that's not true. It means that he has brought you here both for your good, right, that he would be at work in you, but also that you would be a, a conduit, in a sense, for him to work in others. And the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit is at work in so much else. 
Right? We simply don't have time, but he is at work in power that you might be able to forgive others and forgive what seems unforgivable, that he might bring about reconciliation in your relationships, that he might help all of us to grow in our reliance and our trust upon God in the midst of terrible trial and trauma, to find strength in weakness, to face death or loneliness or persecution or depression or, or anything else, right? This is the power of God himself, his spirit that is at work in you, right? Do you recognize that? Do you realize that? And finally, is the temple of God, as a dwelling place for the spirit of God, do you realize the privilege that you then have, the many blessings that that means for you. The Spirit of God is a a testament to God's love that he has shed abroad in our hearts. If God did not love you, he would not have given you his Spirit to dwell within you. If he did not plan to redeem you, he would not have empowered you. Right? Would he make his dwelling among those that he simply despised? Of course not. Think about the privilege that you have in, in knowing the living and true God. Just before this in 1 Corinthians, Paul speaks about the, the work of the Spirit of God as he searches the deep things of God, right? the, the, the deep knowledge that is within God, that the reality of who he is, and he makes that known to us then. God is not unknowable, right? He is not aloof. When we talk about the Holy Spirit, we're not talking about a a force that is out there, an energy that runs through all things. No, we're talking about the person of the Holy Spirit, God himself, God the Spirit. He is knowable, And he's knowable because he has has dwelt within you. He makes himself known to you. What a privilege we have to have access to the scripture, which is God's breathed out word. Right? Not as as just the, the physical, you know, ink on the pages, but as the the very words of the Holy Spirit as he brings them to life, as they become living and active for us. It's it's very common to disconnect the work of the Holy Spirit and the Scripture. We disconnect them as if they're somehow separated. So on one side, you can have an overly intellectual view of the Scripture, an overly rationalistic view. Again, it's it's just ink on a page. I'm just kind of studying it like I would any other book. And it just is a, it's just a cold, dead, it's just a book. And on the other hand, you can have those who look down on someone for loving the scripture so much that they would say, wow, you just believe in, you know, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Bible. Right? You don't really care for the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is, is different from the scripture, separated from the scripture. But that is really to misunderstand what the scripture is. It fails to recognize that it is the Holy Spirit that speaks in the Scripture. That it is God breathed, that the Spirit is the breath of God. Spirit means breath or wind. When we say that the Scripture is God breathed, it means that it is the Holy Spirit that is revealing these things, making them known. Right? Jesus, Jesus breathes on the apostles, he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And when the word of God is read and when it is heard, it is the Holy Spirit who is speaking. The authors of Scripture were carried along by the Spirit of God. It's not not just a book. No, this is God's Spirit at work. So what a privilege it is that we have such a word from the Spirit. What a privilege it is that we have the guarantee of future glory that is the Holy Spirit that dwells within us, right? The living reality of where we're heading, 
of who we belong to. He is, we're told, the initial deposit, a seal on our heart, testifying to whom we belong. So what privileges you have as the children of God, right, to be filled with the Spirit, to have the Spirit of God at work among you as His temple. And as we come to the end, you need to, to know that, right, recognize Right? Don't you know that God's Spirit dwells in you? He is in your midst, in your heart. And if He is the perfecter, it means that He is carrying out to completion. He is, he is bringing about the perfection of the work of God in your life. So you can know then the the holiness and the power and the privilege that you have, that God would dwell in and among you. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit of God, we do pray that you would come upon us in power. That you would reveal yourself and make known to us this reality that you are dwelling among us. And that now as we have heard your word, that you would take it and truly apply it to our lives. That you would bring these things about in our mind and in our heart and in our actions. That we would reflect the truth of your word and that you would fill us with the peace and comfort and power and knowledge that only you can. Would you do this, Lord, as we pray it in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.